This morning, uh, we are continuing in our series. This is the second week. Uh, we're doing a series called Singleness, Marriage, and Sex. Uh, and uh, it's a series where we're going to dive into some of the most important practical things of our lives. That is relationships, uh, specifically romantic relationships, uh, or a, a life uh, of just living in community together and various states of relationships, single, married, uh, wherever we find ourselves. And uh, we're also going to be talking talking about one of the more controversial issues in history and in our modern world, uh, that is sexual ethics. So what does the Bible say uh, about sexual ethics? And uh, I did mention this last week we, as we kicked the series off. There are some sermons in this that I would say, you know, parental discretion is advised for the little ones. Uh, I would say anyone middle school or up, I mean, obviously you get your, it's parental discretion, so it's up to you. Uh, but I would say middle school and up, this is probably, this would, you know, any kids that would be youth age, this, we're not going to get any thing too crazy. And honestly, it's it's probably good. I mean, it's very good to hear what the Bible has to say uh, about this. And if you're here and you're like, man, what, uh, where are we going to go in this series? I just would like to say, really, the big idea, our heart is this, is that when we look at the Bible, we put the Bible up here. We believe the Bible uh, is God's revelation to us. It's God's wisdom to us uh, and that we submit to it. And something that's happened in our day and age is uh, a lot of times people don't even realize they're doing it is that uh, we look at the culture and we go to the Bible and we say, oh, this doesn't fit with the culture. We've got to change our interpretation of this so that the gospel is more palatable to the culture. And uh, to that, I just say in 1 Corinthians, Paul, when he's talking, uh, he says this line, it came up this week as I was talking with some people. Uh, he said, Greeks demand wisdom, right? They were like the wise philosophical, uh, philosophical people. Philosophical? That's like a weird Greek food. No, uh, so, uh, <laughs> it's not even Greek. What's wrong with me? Uh, uh, but they were philosophical, and so they demanded wisdom. They wanted logic and philosophy. And so Paul said, the Greeks demand wisdom, and the Jews demand signs, but we preach Christ crucified, which is foolishness to Greeks and a stumbling block to Jews. And so this is who we are. We preach Christ crucified. And you're going to see that today, that we, when we look at all of these topics, the first thing we do is we lay a gospel foundation. And, and oftentimes we talk about this idea of, uh, of, of laying a gospel foundation in whatever you do in life. And today you're going to see how that works out because today's sermon is going to be primarily about singleness. We're going to talk about the goodness and glory of singleness. Uh, and if you're here and you're like, man, I am not single, uh, I'm married. Uh, don't think that this sermon isn't for you. Uh, in fact, I think this is for all of us. We need to hear this sermon. God's picture of the church is a blending of people uh, from every culture, every nation, every race, every background. And even if you're not single, chances are that your views of singleness haven't been, you haven't, you haven't shaped them often. You haven't thought about them a lot. And in fact, if you're not single, you, you may not think about singleness much at all. But it's important in any topic for us to understand what does the Bible actually tell us? Where does the Bible actually lead us when we think about singleness? And this may seem like uh, maybe a trivial issue to some of you, uh, but it is not. And part of the way we love people in our church who are single is we, we, we talk about how do we envision them? How, do, how, do, how does the Bible Bible envision them? How do we walk together with them uh, in their singleness? Um, and uh, it's not a topic that comes up a lot, but I really do think it's key. We all have a strong vision uh, of what the Bible says on this topic. Uh, we do exist in a church with both married and single people. We're for each other. Uh, and if you're here and you're married, you're not single anymore, but you have kids, uh, I think it's really important that you understand what the Bible says about singleness as you're informing your kids. Uh, next week, we'll talk about uh, dating and some things like that. And uh, I'll give you some wisdom if you're a parent on how do I navigate this? What does the Bible say? Uh, what, what, what do we do uh, in light of uh, culture and the Bible's call for us uh, to, to do everything uh, oriented around Christ? How do, we, how do we seek out romantic relationships? How do we encourage our kids to think about you know, that if, they're, if that's their, their heart? But today, uh, I, I think it's important we're going to get shaped with the vision of singleness. Um, and uh, we're going to see what the Bible says on this topic. I'm going to just highlight, uh, we're going to walk through the series. Let's go to the next slide here. So last week, we talked about contentment 
and your relationship status. I'll touch on that just a little bit as we kick off this morning because it's a foundational sermon uh, that really lays the foundation for understanding all of this. Godly contentment, contentment in Christ is so important. It does not matter what your pursuit is. If your heart is not content in Christ, you're going to end up going awry. You're going to end up going astray because we are Christians. We are meant to be rooted and planted into Christ. That's what that means. Uh, and, uh, and not just once, like we prayed the prayer and we're done. Every day we're meant to be rooted and grounded in Christ. So that's what we talked about last week, contentment in Christ and your relationship status. Today we're going to talk about the goodness and glory of singleness. Next week we're going to be talking about love, the foundations of great love. We'll talk about friendship. Uh, we'll talk about dating. We'll talk about marital love. And we're going to basically just look at foundations of love uh, that we sort of see all the shades of in the church. Uh, I'm excited about that one. Then we're going to talk about the goodness and glory of marriage. Uh, that's one of the parental discretion ones. Uh, if you know anything about what the Bible says about marriage, you'll understand that. Uh, and then week uh, four, we're going to be talking about, uh, or I'm sorry, week five, we're going to be talking about marriage that changes culture. Uh, and then we're going to talk about sex gone wrong. So uh, primarily uh, just way, like lust and uh, all the various ways that, I mean, you see it in the Bible. Uh, the Bible doesn't hold back on sex gone wrong. Uh, we're going to look at that. And then in uh, week seven, we're going to be looking at homosexuality in the gospel of Jesus, particularly pertinent issue in our day and age. Uh, how, what would Jesus do today? What, how would Jesus inform us? What does the Bible say about these things? How do we approach controversial cultural topics with truth? Bounced with the grace of Christ uh, and a hope of redemption. Uh, and then in the last week, we're going to talk about wider LGBTQ issues and the gospel of Jesus. Again, this is uh, something that, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's something we've got to address and think about. And my call as the pastor of the church is to help you guys see how do we walk out these things? How do we bless? How do we love people? Uh, how do we uh, address a culture that hates uh, the Bible, that doesn't want the Bible to be their authority, uh, wants themselves to be their authority? How do we do this well? And we're going to talk about that across all these issues. Uh, before we jump in this morning, uh, would you guys pray with me? Uh, and uh, and we'll, we'll start in. Heavenly Father, I do just ask this morning that you would come and dwell uh, among us, that you would come fill us up. Uh, Lord, just refresh our hearts this morning. Uh, as I talk about grace, as I talk about the salvation you've given us in the gospel uh, this morning, I just pray that hearts would be refreshed, that there would be people who, here who say, oh yeah, that's right. Jesus, you're, you've cleansed me. Jesus, you've washed me. Jesus, you've made a way for me to draw near to the Father by your work and your effort. And Lord, I just pray for deep, uh, just refreshment this morning. In the Psalms, Lord, you tell us that as we dwell on your word, uh, it's like being planted uh, by the water, by streams of water, Lord. And I just pray that you would just plant us in your word, plant us by streams of water, and uh, Lord, that we'd be refreshed, that we would grow, that we would bear fruit uh, for your name. And uh, Lord, I do, I pray for those who are single and here today, that you would bless them, God, with a vision and with a hope and with uh, just a clarity that singleness is a gift, singleness is a call, singleness is from you, Jesus, and, uh, and you, uh, you use it purposefully. And uh, there's joy in singleness, in serving you and in walking with you, Lord. And uh, God, I just pray that there would be uh, just a deep, uh, holy understanding understanding of who you have called us to be, whether we're single uh, or married or wherever we find ourselves. In your name we pray, amen. All right. So again, last week we laid a foundation and uh, we're gonna, I'm going to lay it again, right? I'm going to lay it again and we're going to talk about this. And uh, uh, that foundation uh, is key in any circumstance. And that foundation is contentment in Christ. Uh, Colossians 3, 1 through 3, this is what it tells us. It says, if then you have been raised with Christ... Okay, so here, if you're here and you're a Christian, <clears throat> you're here and you're a Christian, this, this, is, this is what you're informed to do. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, this is what you're invited into. You're freely invited into this, by the way, through Jesus. Uh, you don't have to jump over any special hurdles. You look to the one who died for your sins, who rose from the dead uh, to bring you eternal life. But this is what he says, if you've been raised with Christ... If you're in Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. 
All right, so the very first thing I think for us this morning is to recognize that for all of us, our primary call in life is not to get focused in on, am I single? Should I stay single? What am I supposed to do? But rather, it doesn't say, it says, uh, keep your mind focused on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. So it's like primarily looking up. And the Bible specifically here directs us to look at Christ. And I love how Paul writes this. He says, your life is hidden with Christ in God. And, and, and I, I just, last week I made this point that it isn't like you gotta, like you're looking real hard. It's that as you look at Christ and you walk with Christ, what happens is the life of Christ, this is what Colossians 3 tells us. The life of Christ is like this. As you're walking, it's like you're opening a present and you're like, oh, I didn't, I didn't see this precious, wonderful gift from God. And you keep looking and you're like, oh, not, I want more. And then you keep looking and, there, and every day as you walk with Jesus, as you walk in the truth, as you spend time in the presence of God, you, you discover like just life over and over again. I was thinking this week as I wrote this sermon and, uh, and I was thinking about that passage. It's just like, how many of us, if we were given the opportunity, would go back and be like, man, I wish I could have been one of the disciples. Right, to have walked with Jesus, to have seen him physically, to have watched him feed the 5,000, to have seen him raise Lazarus from the dead, to have seen him heal the blind and, and the lame and, and to perform miracles like the wedding of Cana. And, and I just think so many of us would say, yes, I want to see that. And that would feel a lot like, I think, oh my gosh, look at, oh, there's more, there's more. Like, and what the Bible tells us is that that's the life we get to live because your life is hidden with Jesus. You uncover it, you discover it as you walk in him, as you walk with him. So whether you're single, married, divorced, widowed, wherever you are, your life is hidden with Christ. That is where your life is, right? The heart of the gospel is this. You were made by God for God, right? We were separated by God by sin, our sin and our brokenness, we, which is basically us turning from God, choosing other things, trying to find life in something besides God, right? But then Jesus came into the world to find the life we were meant to have, to make a way for us to come to God. And in him, we find who we really are. That's what Colossians 3 tells us. And I'm just, I cannot reiterate this enough. You've got to be planted in this every day. You've got to be planted in this every day. Uh, Jesus, when he taught us the Lord's Prayer, again, I know I hit this last week, but right, if you've read the Bible at all, <laughs> you know this thing. It's constantly reminding people who God is. God's people were constantly being reminded, remember the God who rescued you from Egypt. Remember the God of your fathers, right? The Paul's letters, remember Christ, he made a way. Like we've got to be reminded. And, and, and I hope that this is like, man, it's not, this isn't dull. Like hearing the gospel again, it's like, man, this is like a steak dinner. I've had a lot of steak dinners. I'm never like, oh man, you cooked me steak. Like I'm always pumped. I'm always excited. The gospel's better than that. Like every time we see it, every time we taste of it, uh, it, it, it tastes good. It, it, it's, 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 it's a filling experience. But but Jesus, he gives us the Lord's Prayer and he tells us to pray this way every day. And, and I love how it starts because it, start, it doesn't start with like so many of us, this is our bearer. We think, oh, I'm not worthy of God. I haven't been doing a good job. I'm distracted. I've got sin in my life. But Jesus doesn't say start with groveling. He doesn't say start with, with, with self-righteousness. He doesn't say start by confessing all your sins, right? I think sometimes that's how we pray. When I grew up and I was outside the church, the very first thing I would pray is like, Lord, forgive me. And I remember I, I was, I just, I remember I came with this line as a kid. I was like, God, forgive me my known and unknown sins. I was just like, I know I'm sinning all the time, Lord. Sometimes I don't even know it. And like, that was where my mindset was. But Jesus does not tell us to pray that way. He tells us to pray in a way that aligns with Colossians 3. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth, not on things that are in you. If you want to be raised to life, you look to the one who raised you to life. Right? So he says, he says, Heavenly Father, right? our Father in heaven. That's how Jesus teaches us to pray. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. All right, and it goes on. But what I love is all this stuff that comes before this. It's like first upward towards God. Like you are here, if you're here this morning, you're feeling heavy laden. You're feeling burdened. You're feeling like, man, I just don't, I don't feel near to God. I don't feel holy. I don't feel like God could love me. I don't feel like God should love me. Let me just direct you to the Lord's prayer. Like you direct your eyes at heavenly, hallowed be your name. Worship is a way to just realign your heart. God, you are glorious. You're good. The proclamation of truth in the gospel, you've saved us, you've made a way. It's so important for our souls. And we have to plant ourselves in this every day. Jesus, when he tells us to pray for our daily bread, it isn't just physical needs, it's spiritual needs. 
right? And he tells us that to pray that before we come and we, we you know, ask for forgiveness of sins. We sure, certainly should ask for forgiveness of sins, right? But if we start with the sins, I think we start in the wrong mindset. We start in the mindset of like, I have to make myself holy. I have to get it all out. And that Jesus is the one on the cross who died and said, it is finished. And that distinction is very important. It's very, very important, right? You didn't start by works. You didn't start by presenting your holiness or lack of holiness to God. You started by the grace of God, the work of Jesus on the cross. Hebrews 10, I love this passage. Just so helpful. Hebrews 10, 19 through 13, or I'm sorry, 19 through 13, that's backwards. I'm not gonna read it backwards. Uh, Hebrews 10, 19 through 23. It says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and a full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. All right, we start each day in the grace of God, confident to enter the presence of God through the blood of Jesus. Right? If you understand what the Hebrews writer is saying here, right? When they, when they, when they built the temple of God, they had like the outer sanctuary, then they had like the inner sanctuary, then they had like the the most holy places. Like it was like a room that like the presence of God would dwell, and the high priest, like the highest, most holy priest, who had to go through like all this purification ritual just to go in there once a year to like to like sacrifice for the sins of the people to commune with God. And like that room, there was a curtain that divided uh, even the, the great high priest or the, the, not the great high priest, but the high priest of the Jews from that room. And no one else went into that room. And here the Hebrews off, there's like, you now have access into there. You can come boldly into the most holy places by the blood of Jesus where God himself dwells. You have access. You've got to hear this. You've got to be planted in this truth every single day. It doesn't just say that you have access. It tells us Jesus is our great high priest. And what does he do? It says that he allows us to draw near, draw near to the presence of God, draw near to the heavenly father, draw near to the one who gives you life, the one who loves you, the one who made you. You can draw near in full assurance. And then it says, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. I love this. The Hebrews author knows. He's like, I know you're coming in. You're thinking, I'm not worthy. <laughs> I have an evil, I have stuff that's gone wrong. I haven't done a good enough job. I haven't been holy enough, right? It says our hearts are sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Why? It's through the blood of Jesus. It concludes here in, in, in that section that we can hold fast to our confession. We can, we, can, we can cling to our salvation is basically what it's telling us without wavering because Jesus is faithful. It doesn't say because you're faithful. <laughs> it says because he's faithful and you believe in him. You believe he's faithful. All right, we cannot forget about this foundation. We cannot take it for granted. It is one of the easiest things to do. And actually, I'll tell you what, it, it, the reason I start with this, the reason I lay this foundation so heavily is this. I can tell you as a pastor for, you know, was it, this is my 14th year as a pastor. Like I, 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 pastoring for this long, I can tell you this, the thing that, the, 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 the thing hearts need, the weakness that we come into is we forget our first love. We forget the grace of God, All right, Whether we're single or we're married, we get caught up in the weeds. We get caught up in the things of this earth and we forget not just to look upward, but to, to, to walk into the holy places of God with confidence by the blood of Jesus. We cannot take this for granted. We can't forget, you know, we get into our day-to-day -day life. It's one of the easiest things to do is to forget the joy, the peace, the power of our salvation and the life of Jesus. It is your fuel. It is your life. It is your foundation. You're meant to be planted in it every single day, right? It's our foundation, <clears throat> All right? So I've laid it pretty heavy there, but it's important for us to get this. Paul goes on here. We're, we're going we're gonna to shift gears here. We have a passage as we talk about what it means to live the single life. What, how do we talk about that? How do we talk about singleness in light of the Bible? What direction does it give us building on the foundation of Christ? Well, we get this really insightful passage in 1 Corinthians 7. I read it last week. I'm going to read it again. Uh, this is verses 6 through 11, and then I've also thrown in verse 17 because it's a nice summation of what Paul's point in this, pa this passage is. Uh, he says, now as a concession, not as a command, I say this, I wish all were as, I, as myself in. Paul was single. Uh, he's saying, I wish everybody was single. Like he's saying there's something about that life that's, that's, that's appealing and, and good and helpful, right? It's a pretty bold statement in the ancient world. Uh, singleness was looked down upon by most cultures. Marriage was sort of the end all, like the main experience that you're supposed to have in life. Uh, and, uh, and Paul's saying, hey, I wish everybody was single. Uh, and he says, but 
each has its own gift from God, one of this kind and one of another. Another thing, he calls, he calls singleness a gift. He actually calls marriage a gift here as well. It says, to the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. To, marry, to the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. And he goes on, he says, only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. All right, at the end of the day, this is the big idea here, this passage, Paul is saying, walk in the call that God has for you. Walk in the call that God has for you. Right? Coupled with our first idea of the gospel, I can tell you the Bible tells us this. If you are in Christ, walking in him, he'll speak to you. He'll guide you. He'll walk with you in your life, in your singleness, wherever you're at. Ephesians 2 tells us that God has good works for us to do. And one of those includes, if you're married, your marriage. It's a good work for you to do. If you're single, your singleness. It's the call God has for you, that he's planned for you. If that's the season that you're in, God's going to use that season. If it's where you're at your whole life, God's going to use that call as a gift for you and to bless others as well. Romans 12 tells us that we're all members of one another, that, that, that actually we all have things to add. And I love this, this Romans 12, the idea of the, the church. Paul also talks about this in 1 Corinthians where he says, you know, we are all members of one another, all right? Membership in a church, it's not a light thing, right? The, the, we, the word member, when Paul is using it, like the original Greek word, it actually meant like organ, like vital part of the body. That's what it meant, right? Today, you can get a membership at Sam's Club. You are not a vital part of the body that is Sam's Club. And so like our modern understanding of membership has been watered down, but the original biblical intent of Paul in Romans 12, when he's talking about being members of one another, he's saying you are vital organs in the body of Christ, Right? And what that means is that if you're, if you're single, you are a vital part of what makes this church glorious and good because God's put you here on purpose and he has purpose for you. All right? If you're here and you're married, you're a vital part of this church. All right? God's put you here on purpose. Right? And, and this is why we care about membership here at Living Hope Church because you know, the Bible does not take relational covenant lightly. It's one of the big ideas of the Bible. Right? We were made for relationship and not just light surface level relationship, but deeply committed relationships. The Bible says, you know, no greater love is this than a man lays down his life for his friends. All right? It defines love in terms of deep sacrifice in a relationship for others in the name of the love of God. And I love that, right? So we're all part of this church. We have a body. If you're here and you're single, you are part of the body of Christ and you're vital. You're not second class. You're not less than. We're not just waiting for you to get married so you can lead a community group. None of that stuff is true. But often I think it is believed in the culture. It's believed maybe in Christendom or the enemy whispers that in the back of our head. And, and, um, and I think just as we look at these ideas, I made a chart for us to kind of, because I just, there's so much here on this topic of singleness. I thought, let's just knock it out with a chart. Uh, and so what I've done here is I've created this table. We can go to the table here. And uh, there are different ways you can view singleness. Um, there's two views in the church that I think are common or in Christendom that are common. Uh, there's the too low view of singleness, right? It's possible to have too low of a view of singleness, uh, where you just, you see it as, you just see it as worthless. You don't have a good view of it. There's also a, a too high view of singleness, right? Where you see singleness as somehow more holy, as somehow making you more able to, to, to bless and serve, uh, than otherwise. And, uh, that I would say is an error. And we're going to see why here in a minute. And then I also added just because our culture, I think it's important. The culture has a too high view of singleness where in the culture, singleness is increasingly being worshiped, uh, right? Not because of your ability to be more holy and worship the Lord, right? But because it gives you ability to worship your interests and your desires and yourself and have sovereignty over your life uh, and, uh, and to bow down to no one but yourself. Uh, and then finally, we're going we're gonna to compare these to what we can pull from the Bible on the, bi- the biblical view of singleness. So I've created this table. We're gonna, I'm going to talk through the scriptures where we get the biblical view uh, as we go, but I think this is pretty clear and I, I hope this blesses you. And it's just, it's an in a nutshell way to kind of take a, a bird's eye view of this and, and to really break down some lies that I think prevent evade our thinking when it comes to singleness. This is really important that you don't have too low of a view of singleness, 
right? If you're a parent of single kids, like you don't want to be like, right, you got to escape it. You don't want them to think, oh, you're just in a pit. You're just waiting for your real life to start. No, no, no. If you are waiting for your real life to start, that life's in Jesus. <laughs> it is not in a marital partner, right? Like that's, a, that's like one of the least Christian views you could possibly have to think that somehow when I get married, then my life begins. No, 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 no. My friend, Christian, your life begins when you walk with Christ, right? That's where your real life begins. And if you think your life begins when you finally get married, you've misunderstood the Bible. Sure, certainly marriage is a blessing, but it isn't where life begins. Life begins in Christ, right? So the two, the two low view of singleness, what are its uh, marks? Well, the first one, uh, it believes that singleness is a curse. <laughs> I'm cursed, uh, like this is punishment, or I've just not done it right. Uh, or uh, it's a second rate status. I'm not living my full life. I'm not contributing fully. I'm single. It's second rate. Uh, what does the two high, we're just going to work like across the top. We'll just go through each section here. Sorry, I, I had to fit it all in here. Hopefully you're following along here. So at the top column there on the two high view of singleness, how does that compare to the curse view? Well, the two high view sing of singleness views it as supremely holy. That singleness is somehow supremely holy. I was at a wedding. Um, I don't want to, oh gosh, maybe I shouldn't give this example. I'm going to do it. Uh, I love the Catholic Church. Let me start with that. How about that? There we go. I'll start with that. Love the Catholic Church. It's at a wedding, Catholic wedding, first Catholic wedding I ever went to. And the priest was up there. And he was like, and people say, you know, priests don't marry. They vow, take a vow of singleness. I would say the Catholic Church has this view, this, this, this almost too high view of singleness, that somehow it's supremely holy. And, and the priest was up there and he was like, people say to me, you know, Father, I can't remember his name. And, and, uh, and he, he was like, how, how can you uh, speak on marriage? How can you do it? You don't know what it is to be married. And he said, oh, I do know what it is to be married. My bride is the church. I'm married to her. And I was like, oh, no. This man hasn't read his Bible. And I thought, well, okay, wait, sorry, that's too far. But uh, I love Catholics. So that was just, that, I get, I, there's no way that that is like the actual view that they have, right? Because guess what? The church is already married to Jesus, not to him, right? It's like, he's, is, are you married to yourself? Like, that's kind of weird, man. Like you are part of the church. You are not like Jesus. You're part of the church. And, and I just thought this, I thought, man, that is such a high view of singleness that it's just not very biblical at the end of the day. And, uh, and hopefully that doesn't offend you guys. Again, I love, you know, our Catholic brothers and sisters, I'm not up here trying to, but it's just, there's a view that's uh, in some, you know, traditional things, and there's, there's Protestants that think this, that, that singleness is somehow more holy or supremely holy, uh, that you can serve God uh, in a way that's, that's better, not just different and unique, but better. What is the cultural high view of singleness? <laughs> it is this, single life is freedom. <laughs> I bow to no one. I do what I want to do, right? This is, this is increasingly popular. I meet young men um, all the time who this is like their predominant worldview. I'm going to live alone and I'm depressed, but I'm in control. <laughs> and uh, I meet so many young guys like this uh, and they're buying into the deception that somehow single life is better because it keeps you unattached, keeps you free of responsibility uh, and it keeps you in control of your life. What's the biblical view of singleness? Well, it's not a curse. It's not supremely holy. It's a gift and a call, right? It could be seasonal, it could be lifelong. Now, you could say it's supremely holy, but because I, I would say it's supremely holy, but it's supremely holy in a way that marriage is also supremely holy. Does that make sense? Like it's supremely holy because God says it's good. It's not supremely holy in a way that we're saying it's better than marriage. That's, that's the point I'm trying to make here. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we, we see the Bible laying this out as we look to it. Uh, Let's go down to the second column here. What is the other too low view of singleness? It's something to escape up here. It's something to escape, right? That, that if you're single, a lot of times in the church, we can think, oh, this is something I get out of to get to my real life, to get to the next stage of life. Uh, the too high view of singleness in the church uh, is, no, this is something I maintain. It's sort of a work that I'm, I'm vowing to, and I'm going to stay the long. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to contribute. This is my holiness I'm contributing, staying single, all right? What's the cultural view high view of singleness. Well, it's this, single life ebbs and flows at your will. In a relationship, you don't want to be in a relationship. Break up. You have control. You can do that, right? You, you, want, to, you want to date? I'll oh, go date. You don't want to be committed? You know what? You can, you, I, I, just want ca I just want a casual relationship. No, I want, a, I want a meaningful relationship, but just for this amount of time. Like that is the cultural high view of singleness. That it gives you control over your life, over your romance. Like you can, I, I hope you're seeing here, like the, the, this is the, the main push of the cultural ideas here is you get control. Uh, you get control. Sounds a lot like Satan in the Garden of Eden to me when he said to Adam and Eve, like, 
did God really say that? And don't you know that if you follow your own will, if you do your own thing, if you eat of that fruit of that tree, it'll make you wise. It'll be good for you. That same lie works its way into the cultural high view of singleness. If you go your own way, if you do what you want to do, <clears throat> you'll have control. It will go well for you. What is the biblical view of singleness? It's this something to walk with God in. <laughs> That's what I said. You walk with God, wherever he calls you, whether you drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God, right? You walk with God in your singleness. It's not something to escape. It's not something to overthink. It's not something that you white knuckle and like, Lord, look, look at me. Look, I've been single for so long. I've obeyed you, Lord. You owe me one, right? I've done singleness well. Now you get, you got to give me your, my spouse, right? I've done the thing they tell you to do where you just don't act interested in anyone. And then God will at the right time, make someone appear magically. I've done it, Lord. And now I deserve to be married. Like that's, the Bible says, no, no, no. It's a beautiful season we walk with God in. It's a beautiful call, a gift that we walk with God in. That's what the Bible tells us. Let's look here, the next one. <clears throat> the low view, the too low view of singleness. It restricts your life, holds you back, right? That somehow being single keeps you from opportunity. People overlook you. You don't get to lead a community group uh, or you can't serve as well because you're not married. You can't, you know, your ministry is limited, because you're single. I've, I've encountered this view. I'd say this is probably the rarest of these views, but there are people who feel it. They feel held back by their singleness. Um, <clears throat> the too high view of singleness is this, that it frees your life to serve God better, right? You can serve God better. Now, some people might say, I'm going to read the passage that Paul says this, that Paul says, ah, when you're single, you can actually serve God better. That's not what the Bible says. We're going to see what the Bible says. But there are people, the too high view is when I'm single, I'm, I'm able to serve the Lord better, Right, in a better way. That's not what the Bible tells us. Uh, the cultural high view of singleness is this, that single life gives you control and autonomy to do what you want to do. Again, that's it. So you serve whatever you want to serve. You serve you know, yourself. Uh, then the biblical view of singleness is this. It has unique opportunities. You're free in Christ. You're not more holy, right? You're not more holy because you're single. Uh, but there are, the Bible says that there are unique opportunities. There are things that you have freedom to do. They're not necessarily better things, but they're different things. Uh, and that's what Paul's push is at the end of uh, 1 Corinthians 7. He's basically saying, hey, when you're single, you have a unique opportunity to serve that married people don't have. Uh, it's not saying it's a better mode. It's saying it's a unique mode of being able to serve God. But you're totally free in Christ, right? You're not held back. You're not restricted. Uh, you are not, you know, there's nothing keeping you from serving God, especially because you're single. Um, and then finally, the last column here, I believe, yes, last column here, uh, is in the too low view of singles, this idea that you're missing out on love, you're missing out on relationships, you're missing out, like, I'm never going to experience marriage. I'm not going to experience, you know, having a family. And, and these things are very highly lifted up in the West um, and idealized by people. You know, when I, when I finally meet that person, I'm, then I'm going to really live. When I finally have kids, then I'm going to really live. Uh, you know, when I have my family and I have the holidays and I do my thing, like, then I'm really going to live. Uh, the too low view of singleness feels a great despair that we're missing out on love, missing out on relationships, missing out on families. The Bible gives us great hope here uh, because I can tell you that's not, uh, that's not the result of being single, that you're missing out on life, you're missing out on love and relationships. The too high view of singleness is this, is that, uh, yes, you might be missing out on some of those things, but you have an extra special connection to God, right? Like you just extra, it's, it's I'm, I can draw near in a way that others, you know, can't and that is, is better, right? There's sort of this uh, extra holy view in column two. Uh, the cultural high view of singleness, you know, views this, that singleness is better than marriage. It's better than marriage. Uh, it's better than family life. Again, I see this as a prevailing trend in our culture. As I, you know, talk to young men and I spend time around old friends and, and it's sort of this view of like, yeah, I'm unattached and, and, and I'm single and, and I can do, you know, I can do me. I can do whatever I want. It's actually better. Those guys are, you know, they got the ball and, you ever heard that? The ball and chain, the old ball. I mean, that's like one of the most common expressions to describe marriage. And that in a nutshell describes how the culture has too high of a view of singleness in regards to marriage. They would see singleness as better than marriage. Uh, and then finally, what's the biblical view here? It's not that you're missing out. It's not that you're extra special. Uh, it's definitely not better than marriage. The Bible tells us this, that singleness includes a full life of meaningful, meaningful love 
and relationships, right? We see these things in the Bible, right? I'm going to read some passages to you that really shape this kind of worldview for us. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, I said it earlier. So whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God, right? This is, this is true. This is, just a, this is just like, I think, a really representative heart of what it means to find your contentment in Christ, that whether you're single or married, whatever you do, wherever you are in life, you can do those things to the glory of God. And you're not less than if you're single. You're not more than if you're married. You're not more than if you're single. You're not less than if you're married, right? You're not held back in either regard to do things for the glory of God. Uh, then I, and then there's another one here, Matthew 6, 31 through 33. Uh, this, is, this is great. You guys know this passage probably if you've been to church for very long. It says, therefore, this is Jesus. It says, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you, right? Now, this passage is very specifically talking about like material goods and, and, and things that you need, but the, I believe the principles held through the, the whole part of the Bible. You read Old Testament stories, you read all the stories, you read Jesus's miracles. Like this principle is held here in the Bible that if you seek after God, he knows what you need and he will always provide for you what you need, right? So if you're single and you're thinking, man, I need something else, God's saying, no, 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 I have all that you need. Right? I have everything that you need right here in this season, every day. Like we wake up, like the reality is, this is why again, we lay with that, start with that foundation of Jesus. The reality is that in Christ, when we have him, we start with everything we need each and every morning. We're not lacking, we're full. Ephesians 1 tells us that we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places through Christ Jesus. And this is true. So you wake up fully blessed, uh, right? So as you seek after God, if you, as you, you keep your mind focused on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth, right? You, you find your life. You've got you find God provides for you. You find that whether you're married or you're single or you're depressed, wherever you find yourself, right? You, you can find life in Jesus. You can find life in Jesus. You can find, he will provide for you. He'll make a way for you. Uh, and then finally here, the passage that Paul gives us at the end of 1 Corinthians 7, he says, uh, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the, the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord, but the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, uh, how to be holy in body and spirit, but the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion in the Lord, to the Lord rather, All right? So this is the passage a lot of people would say, they would look to to say, ah, yes, singleness is higher, singleness is greater, singleness is more holy. Uh, I don't think that aligns with the rest of what the Bible tells us about singleness and marriage, right? The Bible holds marriage in high regard. In fact, the Bible says, let marriage be held in esteem by all. That's a passage, a verse that the Bible tells us, let marriage be held in high esteem. You know, like this is what we're supposed to do. Uh, and in this passage, it almost appears as though Paul is saying, He's almost saying, hey, it's better to be single. You're just less, you have less stuff that you're concerned about, but that's not what Paul is saying. I, I believe what Paul is arguing here and what aligns with the rest of our passages, what aligns with the story of the Bible, the message of the Bible is this, is that when you're single, you don't have better opportunities to serve God, but you have different, unique opportunities to serve God. That actually, I think that these opportunities, that God did this on purpose, right? That there are things in the church that single people are especially well-equipped to do. There are things in our community single people are especially well-equipped to do. They're not better things, but they are unique things. And there's a unique kind of freedom when you're single, uh, uh, to serve. And I think that's what Paul is getting at here. Um, and his main push here is, hey, I want you to be free from anxieties. He's like, hey, I just, I, he, in, his, in his argument here, he's basically saying, hey, in some ways, living single is more simple. Right? I think what he's actually trying to do is he's trying to pull people out of the, the worldview that says marriage has, like we're going to talk next week about the too high, or not next week, two weeks. We're going to talk about the too high view of marriage uh, because, well, you know, people have a too low view of marriage. People have a too high view of marriage. Uh, and Paul here, I think he's trying to pull people down who think marriage is somehow uh, especially uh, like extra good. And uh, the Bible says it is good. It is wonderful. It is beautiful. But it does not, the Bible doesn't say, ah, being married is better than being single. Being single is better than being married. It does not make this argument. All right. All right. It's important for us to do. I also think it's worth mentioning here that in regards to singleness, if you want to know like a great place to look, we have exam we don't just have biblical truth. We don't just have the gospel foundation. We also have the life of Christ. We have the life of Paul uh, to, you know, Jesus, obviously the God man, right? God in the flesh. Uh, but he lived his earthly life single, right? And no one would be like, ah, he was unfulfilled. Right? That earthly life was unfulfilled. Like Jesus never had sex. 
And there are people in this world today that would say, like, you can't lead a full life without sex. And Jesus lived a full life and did not have sex. And Paul, he, he, he lived a single life that was fruitful and wonderful and beautiful, right? It wasn't less than. Uh, and so it just, I think just remembering that is so helpful. They're great examples. They're informative, practical examples for us to see the biblical view of singleness, right? So how do we wrap all this up? How do I wind this down? How do we come to a conclusion? Well, yeah, I just want to look at some key takeaways here. Uh, first and foremost, just, just I want to remind you guys, singleness is a gift, right? Those days, you know, maybe you're here. I mean, I remember being single and thinking it was a curse at times, right? Not recognizing. It's funny because I actually think sometimes when you get married, you can look back and you can see, you know, you can see, oh man, like I didn't realize how much of a blessing being single was. Like I had too low of a view of singleness while I was single. And now that I'm married, it's like, okay, I can see, I can see kind of how this works. But singleness is a gift. It's a call, sometimes for a season, sometimes for a lifetime. Desiring to be married is okay though, right? You can be content in your singleness and still desire to be married. Like those aren't at odds with one another. I just, I got to clarify that. You might say, that seems complex. But like, it, the truth is the Bible doesn't tell us that it's bad to desire to be married. Uh, but we can also be like, you know what, Lord, I'm content. If you had marriage for me, I'd be content with that. But if I'm single, I'm going to be content with that. Um, and I, again, I think, I think the push of scripture for us uh, in our culture would be to ask God, what unique ways can I use my singleness to grow spiritually and to bless others? What, what unique opportunities does my singleness afford me to bless others and to grow spiritually? I just, I think that would be the question I would encourage those who are here and single to ask, uh, ask God. And, uh, and I would also, you know, I would encourage, you know, to, to push against the cultural view that somehow singleness is, should lead you to a life that's all about you, your sovereignty, your autonomy, your rule, your authority, but rather to submit your singleness, to submit your life to Christ, which is, again, a gospel call to all of us. Um, <clears throat> if you're here and you're like, man, I struggle to see that singleness is a gift, ask God to show you, ask God to reveal it to you, ask God to use your singleness for good. Uh, the next big takeaway we can take is that singleness is meant to be enjoyed. <laughs> it's meant to be enjoyed for God's glory, right? We've got to add that. Uh, and there, the culture certainly thinks singleness is meant to be enjoyed, just not for God's glory. Uh, I, you know, when I look back, I can remember I thoroughly enjoyed my singleness. I came to this church single. Uh, I loved the life that I was able to live with God while I was single. I just literally said yes to every service opportunity. I didn't have to like check my schedule before I agreed to show up at the church. I just showed up at the church. And uh, I was also a single like college kid. So like, you know, I wasn't, scheduling was not my strength. So it's just, I would like double book myself all the time. they will be like, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, I'll do that. And I'm like, wait, I get 10 minutes before and I'm like, I have two things to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, so anyway, but I enjoyed that se season of my life. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, you know, and the thing is, is that again, yeah, we, it's just, it's not better, but it is, it, the scheduling is less complicated. You have, you, ha you don't have to like, okay, hey, you know, with my wife, it's like, hey, I'm going to have some people over to do a discipleship meeting at our church. Like I've got, she's got to know, I can't just do it. Whereas before I could just do it. Uh, and, uh, and again, one is not better than the other. But the idea here, singleness is meant to be enjoyed for God's glory. Enjoy the uniqueness of singleness. Um, this church, I want to bring out this. This church has been greatly blessed by single people. There are many people here who are single and they bless this church. Uh, they add to it. They're able to serve. They're able to give. Uh, and it's, it's great. It's a blessing. Uh, I think about many of you guys remember Paulette. Uh, Paulette Ludwig, who she was a member of the church, she passed away uh, several years ago now, but uh, I had the privilege of, she was on staff here at the church, and she was single, and she was such a blessing. And what I love about Paulette was she was such a blessing to like our 20-something couples. Like she was like older than all of us, but man, we just dearly love, and I just think, man, there's something beautiful and unique and wonderful about Paulette that we got to experience because she was single and we got to enjoy life with her and she got to hang out with us at community groups and she loved it and she could not figure it out. I would come in here and talk to her in the office and she'd be like, I don't know why you guys like having me around. Are you just pretending? You guys remember Paulette. She was always like asking a joke question that she was serious about and it's like, Paulette, we love you. We love you, and uh, we'll see Paulette again one day and celebrate with her. Uh, and uh, but anyway, just yeah, just like the ch our church has been blessed by single people, and um, so you're here to be a blessing if you're here and you're single. 
And the next thing here, the next big takeaway, the church family is a place for deep, rich relationships, right? Single people are needed, they're vital, they're incredibly helpful, right? We see this again, the Bible talks about this. We're all called together to be part, vital members of the church. Uh, I can just think through my whole ministry how I've been blessed by single people. Mackenzie and I, in seasons where it's harder for us to get out, like we, we, have, we have young little children at home. We've had single people come and spend nights and hang out at our house and just, you know, keep us company and just support us. And uh, we had a single Christian friend watching our kids the other day. And and it was just such a blessing, you know, and we're like, hey, you know, we want to make sure you know, we are thankful for you. And, and, but then she's like, oh, it's such a, it's such a blessing. It's such a joy to get to be around your kids. And, uh, and it's like, man, it's like that. You think about that. That's logical. It's like, oh yeah, like you're not missing. You are family. You're part of the family. And I actually think like, if you've been part of the church for a long time, you recognize like some of the relationships we can form in the church are deeper right, than many of our family relationships. I, I like, this isn't church relationships aren't second you know, two relationships. Jesus in the Bible, he says, you know, who are my mother and brothers and sisters, right? Talking about his real blood relatives. And he says, my mother and brother and sisters are those who do the will of the Lord, right? Who walk with God. And so it's like, that's a powerful statement uh, coming from an ancient Mideastern culture like Judaism. And um, Paul says that, or uh, not Paul, Jesus says that. And um, so yeah, like the, the church is a place of deep family relationships. You're not missing out. The depth here is real. Um, and I think uh, single people can exemplify relational depth especially well, and I've been blessed. Uh, so I just encourage you, if you're here and you're single, don't jump into community, dive in, get connected, be a blessing. Um, use your freedom, uh, the unique freedom of singleness to you know, build lots of relationships and connect and bless a lot of people. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, in, in kind of wrapping this up, I think it's common, I, think this, I just wanna wrap up here. I think it's common for conversations about singleness to be too focused in on dating, right? Or how to get out of singleness or, uh, and I just think it's really important for us to talk about the actual biblical view of singleness, which is not a, something to escape. It's not something that's less than, it's not something that's a curse. Uh, it, it's rather, it's something that's a gift from God, a blessing to God, something to be enjoyed, uh, not something just to be dealt with in a temporary way. And the truth is, is yes, yeah, singleness might not be permanent, right? It could be permanent. It could be lifelong. It could be a season. Uh, but I think it's good to learn how to live well, however God calls you. So if you're here and you're single and you find it difficult, I just want to, I'm going to pray here at the end that God would be able to shape you greatly uh, in singleness, that he would teach you how to walk in hard seasons or in things that are difficult to wrap your mind around, and he'd teach you how to walk in those things and grow you. Uh, If you're here and you see singleness as a gift and a flexible season to enjoy and build relationships and serve God, you have so much grace on you and that needs to be pointed out and recognized. Uh, And I believe that we need more people like this. And a great way to stir that on is to live well yourself in those things, to stir other people up uh, in them. And so I'd encourage you there. Um, So uh, the band's going to come. And uh, for all of us here this morning, I just want to, I think a great way we can respond is this, is just coming back to a place of joy in our call. So whether we're, wherever we are, whether we're single, we're married, wherever we are, recognize, okay, there's joy. Like this season of life is meant to be enjoyed. It's a gift from God. Uh, and, uh, and I'm going to walk, I'm going to walk faithfully with God in whatever he has me. Uh, second, I just feel like th- this morning, maybe even, the, you know, I think obviously the, the, there's the grace of God, you know, just relaying that foundation. Maybe you're here this morning, you're like, I just need to be refreshed in the grace of God. That's great. That's awesome. Get refreshed in the grace of God as we worship here. Uh, and uh, as you look to him, right? Worship is, it's literally keep your mind focused on things that are above, fixing our eyes on him, right? Not, it's like we get out of, of the mess of this world. We look up to him and, and then we find our life. That's the value of worship, upward to him, discovering our life in Jesus as we sing and proclaim truth about who God is. Um, but yeah, that's just, that's where we're at. I'm going to read this Hebrews verse uh, to wrap up. Uh, Hebrews 10, it says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Lord, I do just pray that we would uh, one another uh, together here. We would stir each other up. We would uh, walk with each other. We would, um, God, just not neglect to be a family, not neglect to be together. And we would recognize you have a vital uh, call for each and every one of us here in your church. I pray for the single people here that you would bless them. You'd help them enjoy their singleness, recognize it. And most of all, God, just seek out the will that you have for them. Seek out the call that you have for them and walk faithfully in that. And Lord, I pray for 
everyone else here, that you would uh, just bless us wherever we find ourselves, that you would refresh us in your grace, that God, we would be planted in the foundation of your gospel each and every day. And wherever we find ourselves, we would say, Lord, where you have me, that's where I'm going. Where you're at, that's where I want to be. And uh, Jesus, we just pray you bless us and be glorified. Amen. Let's stand together. As we worship in song this morning, we do just want to um, encourage you to respond to what we've heard this morning or to respond to be prayed for he healing or whatever that might be. We do want to pray for you. Um, we'll have teams on either side in the front rows. Uh, also, we have communion that you are welcome to take at any time, just as you feel led this morning and as we worship. And if you feel like the Lord has placed something on your heart that would be for everyone this morning, we do want to hear that and see about working that in. And you can bring that up to the guys um, up here on the front row, and we will see about doing that as well. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Come, Jesus. There is a hill I cherish Where stood a precious tree The emblem of salvation The gift of Calvary should profit while he is crucified yet as his life was taken so I was granted mine my wealth is in the cross there's nothing more I want than just to know his love my heart is set on Christ and I will count all else as loss the greatest of my crowns mean nothing to me now for I counted up the cost and all my wealth is in the cross. 
life you gave your body was broken your love poured out you bled and you died for me there on that cross you breathed your last as you were crucified you gave it all for me hallelujah what a savior hallelujah what a friend hallelujah you king forever Thank you for the cross. There in the ground, sealed in the darkness, lifeless lay the frame of the Father's Son in agony. He watched the only Son be sacrificed. He gave it all for me. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. Hallelujah, King forever. And we thank you for the cross. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. Hallelujah, King forever. And we thank you for the cross. But on that day, what seemed as the
Though her sins are scarlet You have made us white as snow Yes, Lord And though her sins are scarlet You have made us white as snow Though our sins are scarlet, you've made us white as snow, Jesus, yes, Lord. Though our sins are scarlet, you've made us white as snow.
my failures and flaws Lord, you've seen them all And you still call me friend Cause the God of the mountain Yes, Lord He's the God of the valley And there's not a place Your mercy and grace won't find me again Oh, there's nothing better than you There's nothing better than you Oh, there's nothing Nothing is better than you
We thank you for the things that you've done and the things that you're doing and the things you're going to do, Jesus. We thank you. I do pray, Lord, that we would find contentment in you, Jesus, right where we're at, no matter where that is, Lord. And I pray that you would just uh, stir our hearts, what we've heard this morning, Lord Jesus, and that you would just do a work in us this week, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Be glorified, Lord. Amen. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next week.